it's had very low power, you know, down around basically, you know, 10% or less, which is basically a futile study. Um, and recent work, this is a recent paper from Marcus Mutifo's group showing um, that if you look more broadly across the biomedical science literature, um, you see that, you know, there's a large proportion of studies that are basically have so little power as to be futile. Um, now, you might say, well, that's fine. You know, if our power is low, then um, then if we, you know, as long as we control our type one error, um, then we're fine. Um, the problem is that, you know, the type one error may not be the thing that we actually want to think about. And John Ioannidis first pointed this out in his 2005 paper and Button et al. sort of uh, reprised it in their paper. The idea that, you know, what we might care about is, you know, the, the false positive rate is the, the proportion of false positives across all outcomes. But the positive predictive value is basically the probability that if you find a positive result, that that positive result is true. Um, and what they showed, what John showed, and what they highlight is that, you know, when you have very low statistical power, that even when you find a positive result, um, that it's the likelihood that that result is actually true can be very low, depending on what the kind of prior probability of that result was. Um, and this, this sort of uh, fits with a, a claim that Tal Yarkoni made long ago. Um, where he said, consistently running studies that are closer to 0% power than 80% power is a sure way to ensure a perpetual state of mixed findings and replication failures. And I think that, you know, over the last decade, we've seen that those mixed findings and replication failures have sort of come to pass. Here's a, a, what I think is a, a really good example of, of that, um, which comes from the, um, the study of uh, genetic associations between particular uh, genetic polymorphisms and various brain phenotypes. This is a from a review um, by Molendijk and colleagues looking at the relationship between um, this particular polymorphism in the BDNF gene and hippocampal volume. Um, and so what they plot here is on the x-axis, you have your publication. The y-axis is the reported effect size. And then the size of the circle relates to the, um, the sample size. And what you see is that you know early on, you have some very large effect sizes reported in very small samples. Um, over time, samples get bigger um, and the effect size goes down. And in fact, we now know that there is no effect. Uh, it, you know, now that we have very large um, genome-wide association studies you know, with tens of thousands of subjects, very well powered, um, for, for basically all of the previously identified sort of candidate gene polymorphisms, that had been reported to be associated with hippocampal volume, none of them were replicated in these very large samples. They found some new genes that nobody had sort of heard of that, um, that were associated with hippocampal volume, but none of the ones that had been reported in previous studies turned out to be associated. So how well powered are fMRI studies? Um, we looked at this initially in our 2017 Nature Reviews Neuroscience paper. This is an updated version of the figure. Um, that shows basically that, you know, power has continued to go up. This is sample size on the left and notice log scale. So it's going up even, you know, more than linear uh, that, that it looks like here. Um, but it's still, you know, in 2019, the median sample size was 29 per group. I think it's in the low 30s now. Um, and it, what you can do with some assumptions is come up with what is the effect size that that study is powered to find. Um, and the median study in 2019 was power to find a single activation region with an effect size of about 0.74. That's a fairly large, that's merging up one of the large effect size uh, on the, the Cohen's D scale. The question is, is that a plausible effect size? We need our studies to be powered to find plausible effect sizes. If they can only find huge effect sizes, then, then they're not really sort of useful studies. The problem is you can't take published effect sizes and use them as a guide because they're, um, they're basically inflated by the selection processes that go into fMRI analysis. So what we did was took data from the Human Connectome Project um, and did a group analysis on them and then used both, you, we wanted to basically say, how do we know what the plausible regions of interest it is to look at um, for you know, some particular task activation? So let's say we have a motor task, we wanna know, where are the motor regions in the brain? Well, 
the human connectome project had actually laid out some of those regions uh, in the initial paper. Um, and then we further took the NeuroVault database and, um, and basically found the regions that were most likely to be active from the literature um, and combined those regions of interest to find an area where we're pretty sure there should be motor activation. And then we estimate the effect size from that area. So what you see on the left here is um, the within subject effect size. We call this the percent signal change. Like how much does the bold signal go up you know, within a person when they do the task versus when they're resting. Um, and in general, about a 4% bowl change is, a, is about as big as you would ever expect. You would usually expect that in like primary sensory motor regions. And in fact, we see, for example, for the supplementary motor cortex and the motor task, you get about 4%. There's some other things where you get 2 to 3%. These are like whopping signal changes, much bigger than you would expect for almost any kind of interesting cognitive task. But that's within subject. What we really want to know for the Cohen's D is how big is that effect with respect to between subject variability? And so what we see is that um, the, you know, the biggest effects that you find are in the kind of like 0.7 range for, say, for example, for this motor task. Um, and so not even, you know, approaching that the, the, the 0.8 kind of large effect cutoff. And so what this tells us is that the half of the studies published in the last few years um, aren't even powered to find the, the largest kind of realistic effect you could expect for fMRI. Um, and that is, again, a recipe for irreproducible results. In fact, if we go back and look at that, um, that Mueller et al. study, we see that um, Ha, you know, the majority of the studies have what I call a grossly insufficient in, and I'm basing this on this suggestion from uh, the Simmons et al. paper in 2011, this false positive psychology paper, where they, amongst their guidelines for uh, for improving psychological science, were that basically it it almost never makes sense to publish a study with less than 20 observations per cell. Each of the red dots here had less than 20 observations in at least one of its uh, cells. Um, and that's suggest and, and they also point out that like, you know, you would a power analysis would never tell you that the right number of subjects is less than 20. And so what that often suggests is that people are, um, you know, following some sort of interim data analysis and flexible termination rule, which we know they showed and, and we know lead to uh, inflated error rates. We also know that small samples lead to a high instability of statistical estimates, such that you can find a very large effect in one sample, take another sample of the same size, and you find a very small or even negatively uh, 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 sized effect. Um, this is an example of that from uh, this uh, nice work by Felix Schoenbrot and colleagues. And we recently saw that in this, uh, this sort of highly publicized paper from Marek et al. in Nature, where they looked at real brain imaging data, they were looking at correlations between either brain connectivity or brain structure and, um, and various behavioral phenotypes. And what they showed is, you know, pretty, pretty uh, strikingly, you know, if you take small samples, let's take, you'd say you take samples of 25 subjects, you can find one sample out of a bunch of samples that has a positive correlation of 0.64, you can find another one that has a negative correlation of 0.69 between the same brain imaging data and the same phenotypes. Um, when it turns out that the true correlation is going to be some like you know very small amount or or zero. Um, so this just highlights the fact that you know any type of statistical effect is going to be highly unreliable when your sample size is small. Um, now you might have hoped that machine learning could save us, but it turns out the same problems occur here. And Gael Varqua pointed this out in his 2017 cluster failure paper, where he showed basically that you know if you look across published studies of um, of accuracy of classification of various different things, various different diseases or or other phenotypes, um, basically you see that the the classification accuracy almost necessarily goes down as a function of sample size, and that's you know, in part because the, the classification results are highly variable with small sample sizes. Um, and if there's any kind of publication bias or kind of, you know, uh, analytic flexibility where people are kind of, you know, trying different things and finding the one that works best, that's going to inflate those, uh, those accuracy values. Okay, so 
we, we see that the generalizability of neuroimaging results is impaired by low sample sizes. Obviously, you know, sometimes it's challenging to get a large sample size. Um, so one way that we think we can address this is through basically consortia coming together to sort of, you know, share data with each other and, um, and provide much stronger power. We've seen that in the, uh, the Enigma project, which is focused particularly on imaging genetics. And I think it's done a really good job of, you know, bringing together very large data sets um, to, to address questions, particularly about uh, genetic associations. Um, we've uh, tried to address it from a different angle through data sharing. So we run the, um, the Open Neuro project, uh, which is a data sharing project for raw data sets, including MRI, PET, and various electrophysiological types of data sets. Now also includes FNIRs as well. Um, and so, uh, so we think that the sharing of data is a really important way to help people bring together small data sets to create larger data sets. Now, one problem is that it's really easy to share data badly. Um, and uh, this, uh, this data sharing and management snafu video from you can find on YouTube, if you haven't watched it, it's pretty funny, um, which is all, you know, basically the sad panda is trying to get some data from another panda. Um, and on the right is a quote from the from the other panda, or sorry, this is starting with the sad panda. I received the data, but when I opened it up, it was in hexadecimal. The other panda says, yeah, that's right. I cannot read hexadecimal. You asked me for my data, for my data and I gave it to you. I've done what you asked. Then later, uh, is there a guide to the data anywhere? Yes, of course. It's the article published in Science, right? So we know that that's not an effective way to share data. Now, we started working um, about seven years ago now on developing something that would, a framework that would allow people to effectively share data um, in the neuroimaging world. And this is called the Brain Imaging Data Structure. Um, it's a community-based open standard for how files should be organized and how metadata should be organized. It's, uh, it's now a very large group. Um, you know, there's a number of maintainers, even more than that I'm showing here. There's an elected steering group. I had been on it and I just sort of uh, rotated off of it. Um, and, you know, a large number of people who've contributed to the bid specification, which is, uh, is hosted on GitHub. So the idea is when, um, when data come off of, a, of an MRI scanner, they're generally in this format called DICOM that is pretty indecipherable. You can see it on the left here what a data set looks like. Um, BIDS provides a way to sort of organize the data that looks like what most of us were doing in our labs, you know, before BIDS came along, which is organizing things into different participants, like sub, we call them subjects, sub-01 and so on. And within that, we organize by anatomical data, functional data, diffusion data. So BIDS provides a guide for how to do that. Um, so if we look at, you know, within that data set, uh, we've standardized for, for MRI data, we've standardized primarily on the nifty file format, which is a file format that pretty much every software package can read. Um, there's metadata at the kind of the study level about, for example, the different subjects and who they are, how old they are, their sex, and so on. Um, there's metadata about each individual imaging file. So the nifty files don't contain a lot of interesting, useful information. So what we do is when we convert the, the files to nifty, we also save out all the information from the DICOM header into a, a JSON file, which is much more flexible in what it can store. So you can, for example, store slice timing and various other things in that file. So each image file is meant to have what we call a sidecar JSON file that contains all that metadata. Um, then we also have, in terms of like how things are named, we have naming templates for how directories should be named and how files should be named that provide a lot of flexibility for different types of, of data. Now, um, you know, part of the reason that we started building uh, BIDS was we wanted to be able to ingest data into Open Neuro in a way where we could sort of, you know, automatically tell whether they fit the standard or not. And, you know, a user, if you don't have a way to tell a user, yes, your data set meets the standard, and they can't know if they're actually doing a good job of converting to the standard. So, um, so we, um, we developed this automated validator, which runs, you know, in a browser or on the command line that one can use to basically tell whether any particular data set, um, is, uh, passes the bid standard. It runs really quickly, even on large data sets, because it doesn't actually open the files. It just looks at the, the structure and the metadata. Um, so you can find that at, at the bid standard, uh, website. So we use this when people go to upload data into Open Neuro, 
Um, this is an example of what you might see. You know, you basically you say, hey, here's the files. It looks at the data before ever even uploading them. It basically looks at them on your system and says, hey, you know, in this case, it just found some warnings. And then you can go ahead and sort of upload the data unless you want to fix the warnings. Now, one of the things that, that uh, we did in developing uh, the BIDS framework was include a way to extend the framework. Um, and, um, and that's actually been really successful. So we now have all these different extensions that I'm showing here, different electrophysiology, PET, different MRI methods, microscopy, and FNIRs. And there's ongoing work both around other raw data types, but especially around what we call derivative data types, which are basically the outputs of processing of data. Obviously, that's a much more challenging thing to try to capture than raw data, but I think we've made good progress. Um, BIDS has been really heavily adopted by lots of different projects, um, the, and it was endorsed by the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility. Um, just one example of sort of, you know, how much BIDS data is out there comes from this project that we started. Um, I'm going to mention later the MRIQC quality control tool. One of the things that it does when you run it on a data set, which has to be, it only works on BIDS data sets, is that it um, sort of, unless you tell it not to, it will phone home to a, to a telemetry system and basically provide some information about the type of image that's being processed and a little bit of metadata about the quality of that image. So we now have a, a database that's publicly available at this website run by NIH that shares all of the quality control metrics for these data sets. And as of mid last year, um, there were data for about 375,000 unique bold runs and about 280,000 unique uh, anatomical T1 weighted scans. So that just gives you some idea of how much data are have been um, converted into uh, bids so far, quite a bit, hundreds of thousands of scans. Okay, so, so let's turn now to whether neuroimaging data are robust. That is, given the same data but different analysis pathways, can we actually find the same results? And one, you know, one reason to suspect that they might not be comes from you know, recent findings using what people have started calling multiverse analysis. The idea is like if you take the same data set and analyze it in many different ways, do you get the same answer? And in you know, various types of data, the Stegan et al. paper showed that you, know, you often find a substantial bit of, um, of variability in the p-values that one gets from analysis. John Ioannidis has also talked about this as vibration of effects. The idea if you change things in your analysis, how do the results vibrate? And we know there's a high degree of analytic flexibility in neuroimaging data analysis. This is from our 2017 paper where we just walked through like, what are all, you know, how many possible workflows are there? This is just for FSL if you, and just using kind of reasonable choices of different you know, uh, alternatives. Um, we, we came up with more than 69,000 possible plausible workflows. Um, and we know from Josh Karp's analysis a while back that there is a, a large amount of flexibility that people use in their, or variability that people use in their analyses, where he found across 241 papers, there were nearly as many unique analysis pipelines as there were studies in the sample, varying on all different types of things, software package, smoothing, height, and, uh, threshold, and other things. He also showed in an early paper that it actually makes a difference. He ran a, a particular data set from the, the kind of earlier version of the Open Neuro uh, database through almost 7,000 different pipelines and found that you could get differences from like the highest to the lowest statistic um, coming out of the, the resulting analyses of, of, you know, almost eight standard deviations. So some really substantial differences in the results. So we did a study uh, in 2020 that's come to be called the NARPS study, Neuroimaging Analysis Replication and Prediction Study, where we, uh, we wanted to basically say if we take a single data set and have a bunch of people analyze it the way that they would analyze a data set in their lab, how would the results differ? This was uh, really run by uh, Rotem Butmidik Nazaire and Tom Schoenberg out of his group at Tel Aviv, along with a bunch of other collaborators. Um, so they collected a data set uh, of people doing a particular decision-making task um, in, in Tel Aviv. We had data for 108 subjects. Um, and we basically recruited groups of people to analyze those data. They said We said that the group could be up to three people. They had to sign a non-disclosure agreement, basically saying they wouldn't disclose their results to anybody else until we told them they could. And in exchange for this, we offer them co-authorship on, on a paper. 
um, the paper ended up having about 200 authors. Um, we gave out this raw data set. Um, we also offered process data if they wanted it, and about half of them used our process data. Um, and we gave them about three months to come up with a set of answers to yes, no answers to nine hypothesis tests, which are of the form, is there significant activation in some particular brain area for some particular feature of the design? So for example, is there significant activity in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex when the size of the amount that somebody could win goes up? And we told them to just analyze the data using your standard workflow, just like it was a study done in your lab. The only restriction was it needed to be a whole brain analysis. Um, we ended up getting results back after those three months from 70 teams um, who gave us their yes-no decisions and also gave us whole brain statistical maps, both before and after thresholding. So we could sort of do a little, you know, we could dig in a little bit deeper. Um, we had them give us um, detailed descriptions of their analysis workflow um, and found that none of the two teams, no two teams out of the 70 use an identical workflow. So we had 70 different workflows out of 70 teams. So what's the effect of the, that analytic variability on outcomes? So what you see here is the proportion of teams basically saying yes to each of these nine hypotheses. Um, they're ordered by that proportion. Um, so just to be clear, if everybody was giving the same answer, these would all either be zero or one, right? Either everybody would say, no, there's no activation, or everybody would say, yes, there's activation. We see three hypotheses um, where you know pretty much everybody agrees there's nothing going on. One hypothesis where you know 85 percent of the teams say yes, so pretty much pretty good agreement that there is a, a you know an effect. And then five of the nine hypotheses, we have like 20 to 40 percent of teams saying yes, right? So that's a, a kind of a disturbing amount of variability. Another way to look at it is across those teams, across the 70 teams. There were 33 different patterns of yes-no outcomes. And for any hypothesis, there's at least four analysis workflows that can give a positive result. This is, if we take the whole brain results um, and look at the, the proportion of teams saying who showed activity in any particular voxel, we see that the, the voxel that is that has the maximum overlap between teams only has 76% of teams saying there's activation in that voxel. Um, this is for the kind of the best hypothesis. This is that one that had 85% agreement. So even for the best hypothesis, the best voxel only had 76% of teams saying that that voxel was active. Now, when we, this is showing on the right, a coral, the, kind of a visualization of a correlation matrix between the underlying stati whole brain statistical maps across teams. And there's a couple of striking things here. One is that, you know, you can look at the, the red and green along the top is telling you, did they say yes or no? For this particular uh, hypothesis. And one thing that's striking is that even for teams that had highly correlated statistical maps, their ultimate decisions could vary. Could vary. They could be saying yes or no, even when their underlying statistical maps are very close. A second striking thing is that, you know, you see this, this kind of grouping, the cluster uh, in kind of whatever purple um, here, um, those, all, those are all teams whose maps are like reasonably correlated with each other. We saw that there was one, another group of teams whose maps were negatively correlated with the main group. Um, and um, when we looked more closely, what we found was that they had actually misspecified their model um, in all in a, in a fairly similar way, such that they were actually getting the opposite of, of what we expected. There was also another set of teams here who are kind of like uncorrelated with everybody else, sort of uh, with each other or everybody else, uh, and presumably had done something else wrong, but we weren't able to kind of dig deeply into that. Nonetheless, if we took the results from all the teams, even including the ones who, who did things wrong, um, and do a, a image-based meta-analysis, we do see consistent results, particularly for for this one particular hypothesis five, the one that had the strongest agreement, we see you know kind of nice meta-analytic results that look roughly like what had been shown for this task in the literature before. Um, so this highlights the fact that you know we're that analytic flexibility is a huge problem when you get into fields with uh, complex data like neuroimaging, and this has also been shown in other fields as well. Um, so how can we fix this? Well, one way we think we can fix it 
that doesn't necessarily get rid of the flexibility, but well, sorry, it doesn't um, get rid of the differences between, uh, between pipelines, but it does at least prevent people from sort of using the flexibility to kind of, you know, to find results that they might not have found if they had planned on a particular analysis pipeline. And that is using pre-registration where basically before touching the data, you write down what you're planning to do. And what that does is it, it doesn't keep you from doing exploration, but it ensures that when you write the paper, the things that were pre-planned get described as pre-planned and the things that were exploratory will be described as exploratory. This had a pretty impressive effect uh, in the medical literature. So in the year 2000, the, um, one of the NIH institutes that supports uh, you know, drug studies and dietary supplement interventions um, basically started requiring registration of the primary outcome of clinical trials. That is, what is the thing you're measuring that you want to see an effect in? Um, and this, but the plus signs here are basically studies that showed, a, that claim to show a positive effect um, and the, the kind of uh, filled points are ones that show a null effect. And you see that prior to pre-registration, um, the majority of studies were claiming to have found a benefit. After pre-registration, the majority of studies are now finding a null effect for their primary outcome. It's not as if drugs stopped working in the year 2000, right? What we think has happened is that um, people are no longer able to kind of, you know, pick and choose and kind of move the goalpost for their study, they have to go with what they initially said, and that's often going to be a null effect. Um, and so that gives us, a, we think, a much truer answer about what the underlying uh, effect really is. Another thing that we've been working on is building infrastructure and tools to support what we call multiverse analysis. The idea is like what you'd really like to do is run your data through a number of analytic workflows and then assess the degree to which the results converge, right? Obviously, you want them to be kind of reasonable workflows, but sometimes there's no right answer about how do you analyze your data. So we want to know, you know, what do you see when you kind of, you know, combine across those workflows or when you compare the workflows? So we've been doing a bunch of work um, in particular, developing a framework for describing statistical models in a machine-readable way. We call it the BID stats models framework. Um, and we have a project called FitLens that basically takes those, um, those BID stats models frameworks along with a, a BIDS data set um, and can process them uh, in an automated way. And that's going to allow us to run you know, large numbers of models at scale. We also think that, you know, that you know, we need to move towards using better tested software tools, right? You know, many groups use tools that have been sort of you know, developed in-house, developed by graduate students or postdocs. And we know that a lot of that, that tooling is not developed with, you know, sort of uh, industry standard software engineering practices in mind. Um, and so we've been developing a, a framework that we've, that's come to be called the NIPREPS framework, which basically encompasses a bunch of different types of tools. I'm going to focus particularly on um, this tool at the top uh, called fMRI prep and, and also on MRI QC. These are sort of applications that work with bids data to do kind of, you know, best in breed sort of processing. Um, and they're, they're all examples of what we call bids apps. So Chris Gordolewski developed this idea that, you know, if you want to, if you want people to start putting their data into bids, one way to do that is to, to make it such that if your data are in bids, you can easily apply, you know, particular uh, data processing tools. And so um, fMRI prep and MRI QC are both examples of bids apps. So here's what, you know, when you run MRI QC on a data set, um, it basically provides you with a really easily digestible report, both at the group level. For example, you want to know, like, you know, how does signal to noise ratio uh, differ across subjects? Are there any outliers? For example, you might, you know, you can click on one of these people who's an outlier here and see an individual report and try to look at, you know, what might be going on for that particular person. Um, so it's a, it provides a, a really easy way to get, you know, solid quality control data or an MRI data set. Um, fMRI prep basically takes in a, an fMRI data set and processes it in one in a robust way such that it, um, it basically runs on almost any fMRI data set. And every, you know, whenever we find an fMRI data set that it doesn't run on, we try to fix it so that it can. Um, 
and does it in, in a way that takes advantage of, you know, whatever information are there. If you've given information about slice timing, it can do slice timing correction. If you get, if you have um, field maps, it can do uh, field map correction and so on. Um, so what fMRI prep does is, you know, builds this workflow and we, we try to provide a lot of information about how well things work. So for example, you know, one common failure point in fMRI preprocessing is the registration between the structural image and the functional image. So we provide some reports. You can't see the animation here because um, this is a static image, but basically you see an animation that pops back and forth between the structural and functional image with the surface overlaid on it. It helps like failure of registration just pop out at you really quickly. So if you, even for a large number of data sets, you can pretty quickly look through their reports and see whether it worked or not. Um, fMRI prep has getting, been getting a substantial amount of usage. It also has a telemetry system that basically tells us whenever somebody tried to run it, was it successful? If it wasn't, what was the, you know, what kind of crash occurred? Um, and this shows from the end of, of uh, 2022, um, the amount of usage that we've been getting. And you can see that most weeks it's over 5,000 runs. Occasionally somebody runs a whole lot of them. This is almost 25,000 runs, but it's getting a substantial amount of usage. So now let's turn to whether the results are replicable, um, which means same analysis, different data. Um, and we know at least, you know, there's, there's certainly suggestions that um, imaging results are not replicable. There's a, an early paper from Bukal et al. that showed this around uh, brain behavior correlations in very small samples. Um, but one of the challenges is that um, how do you reproduce the same analysis? What we found in in the NARP study was even um, with a standards compliant written description of the workflow, it's impossible to tell what was done in the analysis. And so we think that it's basically necessary to, for people to share their code. And this is a, a great quote that I like to use from David uh, Donahoe from a while back. An article about a computational result is advertising, not scholarship. The actual scholarship is the full software environment code and data that produce the result. Another important question is like, what does replication actually mean? What does the same result mean in fMRI, right? Because we're not just looking at like one hypothesis test, we're looking across the whole brain. Um, and this paper by uh, Chani Wu and colleagues sort of nicely pointed out this challenge where, you know, they would see that, you know, papers that claimed to replicate another finding often had results that differed pretty substantially from the original finding. Um, so, you know, we think that the replicability is of, code, of fMRI is imper imperiled both by the lack of code sharing and by flexibility in the definition of replication. Um, and so, you know, we, we try to share everything and we, we really think that, that, you know, you should share all the code that goes into all of your analyses, basically when you make the, the paper public, either as a preprint or a publication. Often, you know, I think Nick Mars had a nice, uh, uh, editorial a while ago that highlighted, you know, this, this fact that, you know, people are often worried about sharing their code either because, you know, they think it's not good enough or they're worried about having to support it. Um, if your code is not good enough to share, then why is it good enough to publish the results that rely upon it, right? Um, so we, there, are, there's now a really nice way to share your code. If you have your code in, in GitHub, you can very easily um, have it shared out to another website called Zenodo, which is run by CERN. It's a large kind of, you know, uh, repository for, for sharing data and code. This is a, a this is from our, um, our NARPS paper. You know, we say fully reproducible code for all analyses reported here is available at this particular DOI. A DOI is an identifier that's sort of guaranteed to, to resolve. And then if you go to that site, you see basically that um, the data, the code, sorry, from GitHub is sort of stored here. And, you know, the nice thing about doing it this way is if it's just stored in GitHub, people might go to GitHub and if the code has changed, they don't know which specific version you used to run your analyses. Whereas in this case, this is a snapshot of the code from GitHub. So we know exactly what version of the code was, was used to run the analyses. We've seen this to actually, you know, help us solve problems before papers are published. So we had a, a preprint that we had posted about some issues we found with the behavioral data from the ABCD study. And, you know, we claimed that uh, we had found this particular violation of an assumption for 18.3% of all subjects. 
Um, we made the code available when we posted the preprint. The data were already available. And the ABCD team, you know, dug into it and found out that we had actually made an error in this like, you know, horrible piece of Boolean logic here. There was basically like a parenthesis in the wrong place. And so it was, it was like misselecting a particular subjects. It turns out the real number was 447 rather than 1326. Um, this didn't really change the, um, the overall message of the paper. It was ultimately published in eLife. Um, but it shows how, you know, code sharing can actually help find errors that have been made, you know, before they actually make it into a, a final publication. So finally, I want to talk about, you know, can we reproduce results with the same data and the same analysis, right? The simplest sort of computational reproducibility. Um, and the point I want to make here is that sharing of code and data are necessary to ensure reproducibility, but they may not actually be sufficient. Um, and to show this, I want to kind of walk you through an example from a, a study that we published a few years ago. The study where I collected a bunch of data on myself, um, you know, both imaging data, genomic data, other sorts of measures, um, and we shared it all. Um, and we had this uh, Nature Comms paper in 2015 that sort of uh, laid that out. Um, now we had shared all the data, as well as a virtual machine that basically is like a computer that runs inside your computer that could, you could basically build using this file called a vagrant file, and then it would be, be able to run all the analyses and give you all of the images from the paper and all that. Um, this is an email I got a couple of years after publishing that paper. Hi, Dr. Poldrack. I'm an undergrad from Johns Hopkins. I'm working with the data from this project. I've run into some trouble reproducing the results. While there's supposed to be 63 modules, as in the paper website and supplement, when I run the scripts, uh, the, uh, it only results in only 60. I also ran it with the MyConnectome virtual machine, and this results in the same 60 modules. Essentially, the same code is run on the same data, but arrives at two different results. I've noticed that the RC, WC gna R package has been updated a number of times. Maybe this is causing the issue. Um, and so it turns out that that was the problem. So we had used a particular version, um, but the, the newest version was 1.51. And that virtual machine, when you built it, didn't actually specify the exact version. It turned out back then it was hard to specify specific versions of R packages when you, when you built something. It's become easier now. Um, and so that was actually the dip, that was the, the, the problem is we were just using different versions of the package and they gave you different results. Um, we actually even know that different versions of, of an operating system or different versions of software um, can, in, in brain imaging, can give us different results. Tristan Gotard's group has shown this for FreeSurfer where you can get pretty substantial differences in cortical thickness estimates, either between different Linux versions for the same version of FreeSurfer or between different versions of FreeSurfer for the same Linux version. So how do we how do we deal with this? Well, we think that one way to address this is through the use of what we call containers, um, which are basically a way of giving somebody kind of a packaged up version of all of the both the software application and all the libraries that go into running the thing. And then it all basically gets run on the same uh, Linux kernel by by this Docker engine. Um, and so we, um, for fMRI prep, uh, we provide such a, uh, you know, such a, a container. So if you want to run fMRI prep, you don't have to download anything except for this, this thing called Docker, which runs on Mac, Windows, or Linux. And what the Docker software will do is basically go grab a specific version of the fMRI prep application. This is the container. And then you point it to your particular data set. Um, and it will basically run it. And one of the nice things is that it's running it in a in as reproducible way as is possible. And if something's using random numbers, that can cause you know, differences. Um, but other than that, um, you can basically make it be as reproducible as possible because it's running exactly the same software and exactly the same kind of underlying uh, you know, software libraries. For the NARP study, we took this one step further and built a completely automated um, analysis process using something um, that's popular in the um, in the software engineering world called a continuous integration system. We use this thing called Circle CI. Um, a lot of people have now moved to something that's uh, available from GitHub called GitHub Actions. And the idea is whenever you push a new software build or a new version of your software to, to GitHub, 
it will basically automatically run a set of tests on that uh, on that code. And the idea is if you've specified all of your analyses as tests, say in Python, um, then what it can do is you know pull the data, pull the Docker image that contains all the the, the kind of the stuff needed, like the, the packages and libraries needed to run the stuff. Um, it pulls all that stuff, runs the analysis, and then basically gives you out all the results. So if you want to like see exactly the results that went into our paper, those would be available from Circle CI. Um, and so then they're completely reproducible. So so just to wrap up, you know, there's there's many different aspects of uh, of reproducibility. Um, and there's problems with each of them as I've laid out, but there's also solutions that that you know we and others have been trying to develop for a while now to address these problems. So, you know, if you're working in neuroimaging, I hope that you'll sort of think about taking advantage of some of these tools. If you're working in other areas, I, I you know, neuroscience, I hope you'll think about the degree to which you know your the work that you do might benefit from bringing some of these different uh, you know approaches to bear on the kind of questions that kind of analyses that you're running. Um, finally, I just want to thank my lab um, and you know all of our collaborators over the last decade or so who've been involved in developing these tools. Um, if you want to what, know if you want to know more about what we're doing at Stanford, check out our cores center and thanks to those who've given us money. And I will stop sharing and take questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'll open it up to some questions. You feel free to type it in the chat or speak it. Um, yeah. Okay, we have a question from one person in the room with me. Hi, um, great talk. I'm just wondering, have you any, have you ever like found any issues and um, with like legalities of like sharing so across, especially maybe from where we are in Ireland, how it's in the European Union with America, how there's like different GDPR rules. And is there any issue you have in the, the legalities of like data sharing? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, the, you know, in the US, it's very easy to share data because the US regulations say that once data have been de-identified, which includes, for example, removing the faces from MRI images, that those data can be shared um, without any restrictions. They're basically not treated as human subjects data anymore. Um, clearly, GDPR makes that much more challenging. So in general, to share data from a, from a country that's covered by GDPR, you have to have some sort of like explicit data use agreement. Um, you know, it's, it's almost never the case that data cannot be shared in some way or another. But um, for but for people in GDR GPR countries, um, you definitely have to work with uh, legal teams at your institution to figure out how to share them and to to develop uh, um, you know data use agreements for people you're going to share them with. I don't know. I don't think there are any issues with people in Europe using data from Open Neuro. Um, I think that it's really just a, an issue of sharing data that have been collected within the within the EU. Yeah, I've used Open Neuro and it was like fine. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any 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 further questions? Um, well, I have a kind of follow on question from that one. Um, what do you, what's your thoughts on kind of a selfish question because it's about my own project. What's your thoughts on sort of sharing um, the data of like clinical populations who may have, um, so for example, mine's on ADHD, which obviously has a big overlap with like autism and stuff. Um, and at least where I come from in Australia, there was some things about insurance companies getting their hands on that sort of stuff and using it nefariously um yep. so what's your thoughts on I guess sort of data sharing but perhaps of populations that are yep. more like at risk 
Yeah, no, I, that's a that's a very good point. And I think, you know, researchers have to determine what their level of, uh, you know, what their level of risk tolerance is and how, you know, the degree to which they're worried about exposing their participants to risk. Um, you know, most of the data sets in open neuro are from healthy young adults. And there, I think that, you know, even if you were to re-identify somebody and, you know, find out that they were in the study and obtain their brain imaging data, there's not, I don't, I think the risk to the subject there is pretty low. You can't really predict much from imaging data at this point about healthy people, but clearly, you know, there, and, you know, um, I think it, it becomes especially, um, you know, important for, yeah, for things like psychiatric disorders where, you know, somebody might be exposed to, to, to some sort of like reputational or, or, you know, um, risk around health insurance or something like that. We've in the U.S. context, we've actually um, written a paper. There's a legal scholar in my group who's written a paper um, published earlier this year, which argues that we need to actually have regulatory protection against those kind of harms. The U.S. already has this thing called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act that protects people from uh, from in insurance or employment discrimination based on genetic information. We're arguing that that needs to be extended to neuroscientific information as well. We'll see, you know, that's going to take a long time to actually happen. Um, but I think we do need to start thinking about the degree to which either we need stronger protection for people in, you know, certain groups or, um, or also just kind of general protection against the misuse of neuroscience data. Yeah, thank you. No, any 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 questions from anyone else? Comments, thoughts? <laughs> um, well, I guess that's a no. So, um, <laughs> all right. Big thanks again to Ross Paul Jack for coming um, to speaking to us. Um, yes, thank you very much for coming, and I'm sure everyone here has learned a lot and has some cool. important things to consider. When. All right. Well, thanks for the invitation. Take awesome. care. Thank you so much. Now you man's left.